we have been since before Easter, <laughs> since before Resurrection Day, we've been kind of following along the the uh, acts of the early of the early church um, and where how things uh, transpired in the in the early church. Um, you know, we looked at Passover with Jesus dying on the cross. He fulfilled Passover. We looked at unleavened bread when Jesus was buried. He fulfilled unleavened bread. We looked at at the uh, at the uh, uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we find that un, that uh, the feast of first fruits that he fulfilled that. Then there was forty days where he walked and talked and preached, and we've studied through different occurrences during this time, and and we're. Uh, we are now uh, listening to Paul pre or Peter preach, and as he preaches, he has uh, he has took taken them back through their history, and I said last week I'd kind of like to get interrupted this way once in a while as a preacher, and that is before he finished his sermon, they all they said, "Wait, what do we do?" Knowing that knowing what all they knew, they knew that they were not where God wanted them to be. And so they, uh, they said, what do we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. That was last week's sermon. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we, as we come to this week, we come to the early church and the acts, what the early church, uh, the acts of the early church. This, the, this book is the Acts of the Apostles. And so the early church being a part of this, um, we are uh, looking at what they did. And, and, and you read kind of the end couple of verses of what I'm going to read. So bear with me as I catch you up. Acts chapter 2 verse 41, after he said, repent and be baptized, then, then they did. They responded and they, uh, as, uh, as, as we know, looking at the, at the scriptures, they came to, to him, they were repented of their sins, they were baptized, and that day, the Bible, we start out, about 3,000 souls were saved. So it says, and, so those who received his word were baptized, and, there, and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Added to what? Added to the new church. The church age had just begun. God had laid his Holy Spirit upon the, the apostles and forged the church through tongues of fire. He, Peter went from a Christ denier as an apostle to a, a preacher that led Israel to understand they needed Jesus as their Savior. And then, he, and then when they responded to repent and be baptized, they were, they responded, and they were re baptized. By the way, that implies that they did what he said, repented, and then were baptized. And so there we are. And there were added about 3,000 souls. That's a pretty good invitation. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good amount of people that have come to know the Lord in that group. And they devoted, by the way, can you imagine the troubles that that early church faced with all of a sudden 3,000 people added to the, to the 500 or something like that. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that there was about 500 that saw Jesus at one time. So it might have been about 500 people that hung around that area. Now 3,000 more have come in. And he says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were uh, being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing the pro proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their houses, in their homes, they received their food with glad and great generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. 
And the Lord added to their numbers daily, day by day, those who would be saved. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of the Word of God reaching into people's lives, changing their whole demeanor from that one which was a that, that, that would deny Christ as the Messiah to, to seeing them come to know Jesus as their Savior and changing completely and becoming uh, one unit, one temple of the Lord, one body of Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for the fact that they gave record to us so that we can see and, and we can take hope that we too are fulfilling that. In Jesus' name, amen. So, so who was the early church? I mean, we talked about the fact that some 3,000 people come to know Christ as their Savior. They all have been raised up and probably almost all of them been raised up in Judaism. And... Uh, and so they were aware of who God was. They were aware that they were the chosen people. And yet uh, they are now swinging away from the ones who were looking for the Messiah to having found the Messiah by faith. Many of them probably knew who Jesus was. Many of them probably were uh, attentive to some of his teachings in some of the Sermon on the Mount and other places where many people were at, the, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 7,000. I'm, sure I'm sure that many of these people had encountered him before, but now all of a sudden they are unifying together as a church. Now, the word church means, uh, ecclesia means literally the called out ones. And it implies called out of something and assembled together for something. Um, you see the word not just in the word, word church, but you see the word used, matter of fact, in one time in that, in the book of Acts, uh, when a riot took place and the people were coming out of their homes and were rioting in the streets and claiming D Diana, the Ephesians, was the, was the true God. And we see that, and we it's the same word, ecclesia, means they were coming out of their homes and they were assembled together with one purpose in mind. And that's, you've got to remember that when you think of the word uh, church or assembly or the, the, those, those words, just it doesn't matter what you were call, coming out of and it doesn't matter what you were assembled to. It was the fact that you were. Okay, so the church, that's the best description of the church, called out of the world, out of their sin, saved, and then assembled together with a purpose. And so when we, when we realize that they, that they were assembled together, then we have to look at what was it like in those days. Well, they were, they, it says day by day. And that tells me that they were active together as a unified assembly, not just on Sunday, but every day. And they would come together and they ate together, obviously, because of the reading of the way that it, the, the way that it reads. And they, and they broke bread together in each other's homes and, and, and they, and they uh, met together. And so it applies for us to look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 and 25. And that is, let us consider how to stir one another up and, in, and uh, to love and good works not neglecting to meet together or to assemble together as the manner of some is, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we have to realize that as a church, when we assemble together, we, it's important for us to be here. It's important for us to have that same desire to be together. And that's not always possible. I mean, you know, the ox falls in the ditch once in a while. you got to do something there. I can remember as a kid, I tell people all the time, I said, I can remember when getting to church one Sunday in particular, but a lot of times it happened. We got to get to the I'm a church. We'd get, everybody would be sitting there waiting for the fire to warm up in the building and, and sitting there talking and realize that, oh, Bill Upton or you fill in the, you fill in the name, hasn't showed up yet and one of the guys says well i know he had a cow that was about ready to kev and maybe he's been detained by that and have three or four of the men get up and leave and go help him okay well you know that that's that happens 
And it's evidence, actually, of the fact of a healthy church. Because the church was assembling to meet together to worship God, but they were also in, as they were unified, worshiping together, they were centered around the teaching of the apostles, but something else kicked in. And, and you know, it says they were assembled in the, in the, in the, in the, 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 the doctrine or the, or the teachings of the apostles. Now, what did that entail? Uh, we, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but I'll say it now. And that is, they, that was the Old Testament, because that's all they had at that point. As well as the writings of letters, epistles we call them, to certain churches that the apostles were writing. And so the teaching of the apostles would have been Old Testament and the barely known new epistles of the New Testament. So it would be like you having only the Old Testament in your Bible. Could you, could you show Christ from that Old Testament? Could you talk to people about how Christ was the Messiah just from the Old Testament? They did. And, the, and, and then, you know, but they fellowshiped from house to house and they partook of the Lord's Supper together in that. And, and I, I heard a preacher say this morning on the, on the, uh, in the way uh, before we come to church that these people were, uh, were getting together and worshiping together in a house church setting and so they would all bring their food. See, because they didn't cook roasts at home and then expect the preacher to shut up in time to get, the, to get home to it. So what they did is they just brought their food with them. And that way it didn't matter if he was preaching or whether they was singing or whether they was, uh, somebody was giving testimony, that they could just break and have, have lunch and then they went on about their own. But it ended with a partaking of the Lord's Supper. That was, that's pretty commonly understood. They ended that together. And praying together, that's important. Uh, the church needs to be a house of prayer. The church needs to be a church that does just exactly what we did a while ago, sit down and talk about who we know that needs prayer, and we give you something to remember how to pray for them, and we expect to each other to pray together, as well as corporately when we get together and pray. So they were practicing what is, what is the right word for it is koinonia. And koinonia is a, it means community. It's the same word we get for community. But koinonia, when you, when you look at the definition, as I pulled, I adapted this from Wikipedia because I, I didn't like the way it said it in one area, so I kind of changed it around. So don't give them full credit for this. Some of this was me interfering with them. But it is, koinonia is a transliterated form of the Greek word, which means com communion or joint participation. When we see participation together as a group and identified especially in the state of fellowship and unity that should exist in the Christian church of today, that we should be com communing, I see community, communion, and, and, and common is all from the same word. And so what it means is, is that as we get together and as we fellowship together, we would also be concerned about each other. So-and-so is pregnant, so we, what can we do to help take care of them? What, are the, what do we need to do that? So-and-so is sick, how do we take care of that situation? Do we need to take meals to them? Do we need to go over and visit them? Do we need to go over, as I did this morning, and pray with them before, before we get to church even? You know, what do we need to do? That is part of koinonia. And, and when we look at it, the best example that we can have is synergy. And the word synergy means literally it's an, an, an increased effectiveness that occurs when two or more elements work together. Like a team of horses. You have a horse that can pull a certain amount, but you set him in, in, in harness with another horse of the same caliber 
And it doesn't just double the amount of, that they can pull. It magnifies to about 10 times what he can pull. Why is that? And it's called synergy. Uh, you get the same thing, Cole, whenever, whenever you take, whenever you take one, uh, one, one line out as a winch line and pull, well, that's one setting. But when you make a snatch block and you pull maybe two or three times, you get much more power out of a winch. You get my point? I'm just saying this, uh, that is what synergy is. And, the, and, and now you never look at your rig anymore without realizing, you know, when two or three are gathered together, there's Christ in the middle of them, okay? It's synergy. It is that, it is that interaction in the body of Christ. Now, how does it apply to the church? It's simply this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14 through 17 says the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. You, you are a picture of synergy, in other words. So it is with the body of Christ. Some are, of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not of the body because I am not a hand, it does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would we hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would we smell anything? Your body is a synergy. Now, how does that work? It's just simply this. The Holy Spirit gave gifts to the church and each gift makes you an intricate part of a synergy of the, of the church, the very house of God. We can't do it without you. We can't have people who, well, our, our recent problem with, uh, with, uh, with pestilence was that there was an, a tendency to make us try to stay home and not go to church. Well, the problem is with that is people get used to going downstairs in their pajamas and watching the church service on the TV and then going on about their day. That doesn't fit what the church needs to do. It may be proper if you're ill, or if, you're, or if there's something going on, uh, I know people who are right now, matter of fact, uh, that are, that are going to watch the service, watch the preaching, because they cannot be here today. Now, that's okay. I'm not talking about that. That's a good thing. But when it becomes a habit and it becomes over and over and over of never going to the church, something is lacking. Why? Because your gift... And you may not even know what your gift is, but your gift synergy-wise works with other people in the church area. And so all of a sudden, we are way more effective as all the gifts are participating together. And, and, and I can just imagine that as I'm talking, somebody's saying, well, you know, I don't have any gifts. I don't know what I, I don't bring anything to the church. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Because my Bible says that the Holy Spirit gave us severally, that means he gave us sometimes more than one gift, as he thought profitable. That takes it out of you understanding what your gift is. God understands what your gift is, and he put it in you at salvation and you are to apply your gift in concert with everyone else. That, that's what makes church, church. Okay, you get it? We are not going to church, as somebody said. We are the church. We are the church. Koinonia happens when you start doing what God created you to do. Oh, let me back up and let me read uh, Chris Dahl's uh, statement. We, it is just simply this. 
We need to stop focusing on getting people into our buildings and start focusing on getting people out of our buildings into the culture around us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we, if we can do this, then we will truly see the local church for what it is, a hospital for sinners and a hotel for saints, okay? We saints, I have always said, you come here, and yes, you are a saint. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're a saint, okay? Get the old Catholic version out of your head because you don't, you see, you, 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 we always say, oh, I, I'm not, I'm not holy. I'm not, I'm not, it. you are holy because Jesus is holy and he is in you. You are a saint, not because you act like a saint sometimes, but because Jesus declared you to be a saint. We, we together? All right. So as we work together, he says we need to th- stop Focusing on getting people in, that's always nice. It's always in, encouraging. But the main focus ought to be for us to come together, to build energy, to t- come together and learn more so that we can be effective when we go out and talk to your friends, to talk to your coworkers, to talk to those who don't really want to hear it anymore. Like the, like the one man that I told you about that when I was... Went before I, between the time when I surrendered to preach and the time that I actually took my first church was a, a big education time for me, not because I was going to college for it. I didn't ever go to seminary, but I was taking seminary courses at home and still working in the, in, in the, in the gas field. And the guy that they had, that they had selected to, to learn my job so that he could take over after me well, he was my guinea pig in a lot of ways, <laughs> and the poor guy. He, fi- I, I always had a Bible open on the on the console and in, in on the seat between us, and I, I was always listening to preaching uh, on the on the radio, and telling him about Jesus. And when he finally he just got to the point, he just said, "I'm done. I don't I don't want to hear it no more." And after I took after I'd been preaching a while, after I'd pastored a couple of churches, I looked back one morning before, when he came in, and there he sits in the back of the church at, before church started. So I walked back to him, and I called him by name, and I said, how you doing? And he says, you remember when I told you I didn't want to hear it no more? He says, I'm ready. I'm ready to hear it now. It had worked on him for several years. And so that's what I'm saying. You never know when you're gift is going to be used beyond your understanding. So bring it together, learn all you can, and God's going to use your gift. By the way, what is a tool? A tool is nothing. It is the hand of the man holding the tool, okay? The tool, as bad as you want to blame it on that tool, that tool doesn't make mistakes, (laughs) <laughs> okay, okay, guys. All right, I can see over the whole room. How many of you have smashed knuckles because it's because it slipped off at the most inappropriate, inappropriate time, and you smashed your knuckles on the on the block of the engine or whatever you were working on? Guess what? It might you might throw the tool, but it wasn't the tool's fault. Okay. It's, it, 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 you are a tool in the hand of a God who never makes mistakes. Oh, now that changes it just a little, doesn't it? Your gift isn't going to be handled wrong because you're not the one using it. You are allowing God to use you, and as he uses you, your gift applies, and the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to do what your gift says to do, People tell me all the time, I couldn't get up and lead this singing because that's not my gift. Guess what? It's not a lot of people's gifts, but if you'll get up there and do it, God will use it. He will, even if it's not your gift. I had a little girl one time, and I'm telling a lot of stories today. I've got to hurry. But she, she constantly was wanting to sing up in front of the church. And she couldn't, she couldn't carry a tune in a bucket with a lid nailed down. She just could not carry a tune. And I just said, okay, 
That woman took her every Sunday back to the piano and would hit a note and tell her to sing it. And then she'd say, no, go up, go up, go, go up, go, to, you know, go. And she would try to tune that little girl's ear. And that little girl ended up singing specials a lot in our church. Why? Because the gift that she had, because she was desirous of using it constantly. It's a good sign of a gift. Got desirous of using it. It just needed a little bit of encouragement from someone else with a different gift. Now I'm into something else. Understand koinonia happens when God takes you and starts using you to be what God created you to be in the body of Christ for the body of Christ. Did you get, did you get out of that? He's going to use you to affect the body of Christ while you are in the body of Christ. Okay, So you may not be a gifted wonder. You may not be the most, you may not be the, the, the sharpest tool in the, in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the box. But listen, God can take anyone and use him as he is because he will give you more than you have. Okay? And so he'll take the desires of your heart and he'll use them to benefit the church. That's koinonia. Now, the gift in the body of Christ is more, one of them is not more important than another gift. Somebody says, well, you're gifted at speaking. You can talk to anybody. That doesn't always help. Sometimes it is the prayer that is what is needed in that person's life. And so God will use the person with prayer as a, as, as a gift to be used to help someone like myself that just talks to anybody, okay? Uh, you know, I talk to the, the people in the grocery line. I, I don't care, you know. I'll, I'll tell them when they ring me up and they'll say, they'll say, well, well have a good day. I'll tell them God, God made every day good. He made all of them. And then, you know, it, try to open a door. I've had guys carrying out the, the, the groceries getting to witness to them on the way there. I, I, God just made me to where I, my mom said whenever I surrendered to preach, I, told, I called mom and told her, and she says, huh, I knew God put a voice on you like that for some reason. It's just who I am because that's the way. But listen, God will use even, if you talk to Kathy Downey, she'll tell you I couldn't speak in speech class. What happened? There was a gift of God that had to kick in for me to be able to do it. I'm, I'm going to blame it on God. So God will use you where he needs you. Keep that in mind. All you have to do is interact. So warning, just a real quick warning. Judgment is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. You agree with that? Judging other people and condemning them especially is not uh, you know, maybe their gift isn't what you understand. Keep your mouth shut and let God do it. Let God work in their lives. Maybe their life isn't as pretty as yours in your, in your opinion. Maybe they don't live in the same situation that you do. Judgment needs to stay out of it because it is not a gift and just because you don't see them the way that you think you ought to see them doesn't mean that God can't use them and benefit you in the process. They, God can use their gift to benefit you whether you see it as a legitimate or not. So when we, first, when we first get the inclination to start judging, please understand we are, there's an easy way to, to look at it. And that is look at it in this term. And, and Galatians 6, 4, and 5 says it right. Pay a careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And, if you, won't, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Now look at this. When you're tempted to judge somebody else's gift and say, well, I, what about them? I don't, you know, I, I don't understand. First of all, look at your own gift. And then ask, is it biblical? Is it beneficial? 
does it build the rest of the fellowship up or does it tear the rest of the fellowship down? See, you need to, you need to realize you are the one who is going to answer to God in using your gift wrongly or in not using it at all. Problem is, I think heaven is all about, for the Christian, the Bema Seat judgment is about receiving rewards for what you have done in the body while you were here on earth. I'm afraid some of us are going to get there and find out what we could have done rather than what we did. And when we could have done more, we're going to, I think, I think it's going to be in, a, in part, the judgment seat of Christ is going to be just a little bit hard on some of us. Um, not saying it's going to be a, 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 a reprimand of any kind. I think we are going to understand we could have done more. So when we look at partnership, the Spirit works in each of us on a different level. And as we work together, we reject pride and selfishness. You know, I have this written in there because I didn't want you to miss it. The attitude, mine, 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 when it comes to working in the kitchen of the church or working in the, in the nursery or the piano. I've, listen, I've encountered it all in 35 years of pastoring. I've had piano players quit because I let a young man one time pr play his piano when he was just learning. He ended up, ended up to be a phenomenal pianist. And she left the church because he was playing on her piano. Can I say this? Mine, mine, mine. You ever hear that? You haven't ever heard that. You don't have little kids. Because when they grab a toy and go, mm, 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 that's my toy, that is not of God. We as Christians ought to be above that. The, it, it's of the flesh and it's, it doesn't help the body of Christ at all. So if you have a ministry in the church and someone else wants to help. Oh my goodness. Of course, we're so few in number, most of us. If you have a ministry in our church and somebody else wants to help, you go, hallelujah. I, you know, but, but, when, but you can't believe how it gets to be to where people don't want to share. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is a much better judge to know who needs to be in there doing than you are. So let him build the synergy of the church by bringing people in, even if they don't know anything. By the way, you do understand that koinonia implies that we love each other, and I put it this way, warts and all. We love each other when we know there's issues, when we know that there's something that bugs us about that other person. We love them anyway, okay? And then, and, 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 you know, he... We have to realize that it's down to this. I am not only willing to love you, that speaks agape love, but I'm willing to protect your right to express your gift the way that God gave it to you freely So as long as you're not hurting other people. If you start hurting other people with it, then somebody needs to step in and say, no, you're doing this wrong. But otherwise, let them go. Let them work together with the rest of the body. Let them see. Stop trying to be the Holy Spirit in everybody else's life. You realize it's the Holy Spirit that, that, that puts people in position and, and the, the puts it there. And so many people want to tell you what to do and what to... Look, and they're, they're having trouble on their own. They don't need help with you, okay? So the bottom line is this. We need, to, we need to live our lives in liberty, but be sensitive of each other. And we need to have the Holy Spirit, if need be, convict them and change them as He sees, feet, sees fit. I don't need to be the one who goes around telling them all their problems. So as we do, we learn to be mature Christians, and that means that we start desiring the solid food of the Word of God, not necessarily just the milk of the Word. Some people just want to hear just the simplicity things about the, about the Scriptures. And the truth is, is 
yes, it's okay to go back and, 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 and minister with the, un, go back over the elementary things, but we need to grow. Your purpose in your Bible needs to be to grow from where you are. Using the milk of the word as a foundation in your, in your apostolic pre- teaching, if you will, you need to grow into the, into the things of God and to go back and just touch base occasionally on salvation and baptism and things like that. It's important for us never to get away from that, but it's also important for us to grow. Everyone in the church should know already who Jesus Christ is because they've accepted him as their savior and how to tell others who he is. You should know that. You've been under the teaching of the word of God. You should know it. how to at least start and then get help from somebody else. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts honor God Christ as Lord, the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. In other words, you need to work to the point to where you can make a defense for why you believe what you believe with and do it with gentleness and respect to that other person. I see so many people that I talk to that are hurt and will not go to church because church people hurt them. That's like soldiers on the battlefield kicking the other person because he's wounded and down. That makes no sense whatsoever. Our position at that point is to lift them up, to build them up, to show them respect. Why do, how, do we do, how do we do it? A lot of time in prayer. A lot of time in His Word. A lot of time living out your faith on a real basis. And a lot of time serving and loving each other. That's what koinonia is all about. So to build a church is to come together to make a point of being together, to fill your place in the body of Christ by using your gift the way that God wants you to. And if you don't know it, first of all, you got to be saved. you got to repent and be baptized back at the first of our lesson. Repent and be baptized. But then you need to find your gift. What... Where is it that that I feel like I ought to be, something I ought to be doing? Where is it that other people tell me that, gee, you did a good job with that? Where is it that in your life, those are usually the things that'll start directing you toward your gift. And then to get into your using your gift and enhancing it to build the body of Christ. Not to elevate your own opinion of yourself or someone else's opinion of yourself. To build the body of Christ and serve where God planted you. We have kind of a strange church when it comes to tradition of of membership. People will ask, am I a member here? Well, I don't know. You've been coming faithfully. You know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You've been baptized. Guess you must be a part of us then. It's kind of the way we do it. It's a little backward way. Some churches think it's funny that, for, that we would do that. But the truth is, as I tell people all the time, I just told Paul a while ago, you were here at one time, therefore you're still part of us. Because once, once you're here, we, we don't turn loose very easy. And serve where God planted you. And it comes down to one statement. Be the church. Don't just be here for entertainment. Don't just be here for, for, because it feels good to be there on Sunday morning or to sing praises. That's wonderful. I wake up in the middle of the night singing praises. I don't know what has happened, but I, I start waking up and I've got a song going in my head and I can't, I can't go back to sleep because this song is in my head. That's, e- that's easy. Coming here and singing corporately together and feeling that energy of the Holy Spirit come up in the room because you're singing with others who are like-minded. You see the point? Be the body of Christ. Be the church. And let God change 
who you are to make you more and more strong, I guess I would say, in the body of Christ. So there you go. The early church. Has it changed? It shouldn't have. No, we're the same. Let's all stand. We're going to sing a song and we're going to go home. And then you can go rescue that roast that you put in your oven. Good enough. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day, the privilege of being able to be in church, to worship together, to praise God together, to sing together, to learn from you, and to go home wanting to apply what we read, what we saw. Father, thank you for this family of God that you've put us in. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family the family of God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make us sing it again. You know what the words are now. I sing it again and feel that feeling of koinonia that I was talking about, that power that comes through, synergy that comes through being together. All right, Becky. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood, joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, bless us as we go home. Bless our homes and bring us back together in fellowship again very soon, Lord. We ask you to be the one who guides it all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a good week. Hmm?